Hello, good evening. I'm Whitney, welcome to Golden Beer Talks. Thank you for coming. I guess you all know you should be on vacation right now. It's August. <laughs> but I'm glad you're not. That's awesome. We're going to get going. We always want to begin and end with gratitude. So first we want to thank the staff of the Windy Saddle because they work so hard and treat us so well. We want to thank goldentoday.com because they always promote our events and keep our community aware of what's going on. If you have never been to that website, goldentoday.com, I recommend it. Yay. And we want to thank Greg Reed back here in the back for the use of his awesome sound system. Thank you, Greg. Oh. I'm going to start by bringing up our deputy chief of mission because our beer ambassador is on some kind of, I'm sure, diplomatic journey. It's a very, very important job he has, man of mystery. But when he leaves, he leaves behind his deputy chief of mission, Barb Warden. She's going to come up and tell us about our beer tonight. I do my best to represent him as well as I can. <clears throat> as I always say, apologetically, when I start talking, I'm not a connoisseur of beer like Frank is, so I will just say, with regard to Mountain Toad's IPA and wit that we're having tonight, that we tasted many beers last night at Mountain Toad, and we considered that these were both splendid representatives of their class. They are also... Standard on tap at Mountain Toad, so you can have them anytime you want. Now, I'm going to talk about special events coming up at the uh, breweries. Mountain Toad is going to have their... Maybe I'm not. <laughs> no, they are. They're having Oktoberfest, September 30th. Uh, but before that, this Friday night, Rolling Doe, their food truck, is going to be celebrating their third anniversary there at Mountain Toad. And so they're going to have music all day and presumably Rolling Doe. And uh, on the 26th of August, they're having a group come in called Build and Brew, and they take stuff, recycled stuff, and they turn it into art. And you can go to the brewery and watch them do that on the 26th. They also have a lot of small batches. Um, be made right now and Kelly at Mountain Toad listed them all off for me she said they're going to have a Dunkel Weiss a black IPA uh, ESB, lemon, hibiscus, Kolsch paradise, pale brandy aged brandy barrel aged stout and as I was feverishly writing all these down I thought it's so charming that she thinks I can spell things like Dunkel Weiss <laughs> Golden City Brewery has Paints and Pints coming up Tuesday the 22nd where you can go there and paint a painting and I think their topic of the subject of the painting is the Eiffel Tower. Probably more importantly yeah, because that has so much to do with Golden. <laughs> Probably more importantly on the 9th of September they're having Golden Fest which is a benefit that they do every year for the Golden Fire Department. In fact, Tamara who was working there today said they actually have Golden Fest copyrighted which is cool. New Terrain Brewery has concerts every Thursday this summer. And so for the rest of the month, I'll give you the rundown. On the 10th, they're having the Grant Farm. 17th, it's Chris Thompson and Friends. 24th, it's Intuit. 31st, it's Bill and Jillian Nershi. And they're having Wanderfest three days in September. It's September 14th through 16th because it's their first anniversary. So they're going to have nonstop uh, concerts and, well, let's say, an expanded beer garden. They're going to have beer tents, many food trucks. They're going to have a photo booth and a family fun zone. They're going to have 20-plus beers on tap. And so you should plan to go there and help them celebrate their anniversary. That is uh, new terrain. What date was that? That is September 14th through 16th. We have so many breweries in this town that most months we seem to have somebody's anniversary and Barrels and Bottles is having their fourth anniversary on September 4th. 
and they're going to have live music all day long. Hala Daily is kind of between interns who does the publicity of their special events, so I wasn't able to get much information about special events, though I'm sure they have them coming up, but I thought I would mention that their big uh, push has always been distribution because they have kind of a specialized thing. Their Hala Daily is the uh, gluten-free brewery, and so they are now available at more than 100 locations. So that's cool. Cannonball Creek, there's no news. They just continue to make gold medal style beers. And that's it for beer news for this month. (laughs) And we have an unusual thing this month in that Our speaker brought his own announcer, and so um, our speaker is going to be introduced by Alex. Hello, I'm Alex, the speaker's announcer. So (laughs) I just have a quick introduction of why I nominated him him to speak today. So I grew up in Colorado, and I spent a lot of time on national forests and in national parks, mostly national forests because we had a dog. Um, But I never really knew about the national grasslands until I met uh, the president of Colorado Prairie Initiative, Trevor. And so um, in the two and a half years that I've known him, I've learned a lot about the prairies and come to really appreciate my time in uh, public lands, uh, specifically grasslands. So uh, make sure I got everything I wanted to say. Yeah, so I've been to a couple Golden Beer Talks now and been introduced to some new topics, and I thought... Um, This would be a good opportunity for me to share uh, a new passion of mine and something uh, that you all might find a new topic. So, Trevor. Do we want the... Do you want me to talk into it or just near it? Into it? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to, uh, to Golden Beer Talks to, to listen to me and talk about the, the prairies of Colorado. This is a passion of mine. Uh, my name is Trevor. I am the president of the Colorado Prairie Initiative. We're a nonprofit 501c3 dedicated to prairie restoration and conservation in eastern Colorado. And um, <clears throat> I started... The Colorado Prairie Initiative, I'll probably refer to it as CPI at least several times tonight. I started CPI when I was about halfway through law school when I started to realize that on the weekends, everybody, all of my classmates and everybody else in town were going west into the mountains, and that didn't necessarily hold as much draw for me as going the opposite direction. And I started going out to the national grasslands and spending time in eastern Colorado and noticing that I didn't see a ton of other people out there, uh, but that I think there are a lot of really neat opportunities out there that are not necessarily being... Uh, taken advantage of. So I wanted to share with you tonight some of the history and the background of the National Grasslands as well as some of the things that uh, you can enjoy when you go see them. So So a very, very brief plan for the evening. As I said, we're going to talk about the background of the National Grasslands, what they are, where they came from, why we have them, some of the attractions and opportunities that we have on uh, on the national grasslands, as well as some of the management challenges and the protection uh, opportunities that they pose for us. <clears throat> so this first one is just to kind of give you guys a frame of reference for the system of lands that we're talking about. All of the dark areas on here are national grassland systems. They're all managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Um, the biggest one is up here in North Dakota. That's the Little Missouri National Grasslands, but we're going to be focusing... Oh, geez, Louise. <laughs> so, sorry. We're going to be focusing on the, one, on the two in Colorado today. It's a 3D presentation tonight. So real quick, before we really get too far into this, can show of hands, who has ever been to either of the National Grasslands in Colorado? About a third to a half-ish. So one thing that you might notice if you ever look at them on Google Maps is you will see something like this, and it gives very much the impression of large contiguous acres, uh, large contiguous areas of many acres of public land. But can I just take this out of the... 
Sorry, that was going to drive you guys crazy, probably. In actuality, the ownership looks a lot more like this. This is the actual ownership map from the Forest Service. All of the green squares are owned by the federal government, and those are officially the national grasslands. The white are private inholdings. So of this, um, this is the, the slide that we just saw is the western parcel of the Pawnee National Grassland. So even though it looks like one large area, in actuality, it's only the green ones that are technically private land. And that comes from the way we came to own, we, the collective we with a capital W, came to own the national grasslands. They're owned by the National Forest System, and they were purchased by the government in the 1930s pursuant to statute that passed after the Dust Bowl when a lot of the people came out from the East Coast and they tried to farm and they tried to ranch in, uh, throughout the West in parts of Colorado. And as we know well, it didn't quite work out for them. So the government bought it back with the purpose of creating a system of lands. Here is an exhaustive list of all of the purposes that uh, the government had in mind when they purchased this land. So erosion control and reforestation were the big ones because obviously in the wake of the Dust Bowl, most of the topsoil had blown itself into Washington, D.C. So we needed an opportunity to, to revegetate these lands and get them back to uh, a more natural state. Now, one thing that you might, not, uh, you might notice is missing from here, and if you know something about uh, our public land system in general and the grasslands specifically, grazing is not mentioned as a, fact, as a kind of point of note, I am personally of the mind that at the time the statute was passed, it was not necessarily contemplated as a purpose for these lands, which makes sense because there was no real grass on them anymore at the time. And the government here... Dev <laughs> I'm so good at this. The government added in the 1980s that they were going to develop energy resources and that that was one of their management priorities for these lands. So there is precedent for adding separate uh, purposes to the statute long after the initial one was passed. And at no point have they added grazing and livestock and, um, and ranching. So it's not really worth um, going into in great detail because it's kind of just up to the interpretation. Um, and at this point... It is managed by the U.S. Forest Service. It's part of our, our uh, managed by the Department of Agriculture. So often you will see the grasslands managed in tandem with a national forest. And the Pawnee National Grassland is managed in tandem with the Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forest. The Comanche National Grassland in southeast Colorado is managed with the Pike, San Isabel National Forest, as well as the Cimarron National Grassland in Kansas. Uh, so as part of the U.S. Forest Service land, they're obviously governed by U.S. Forest Service regulations and statutes and their forest plans, which then also implies that multiple use standard controls. And we'll touch back on multiple use, but as we go forward, multiple use basically means that the government has to figure out a way to use this land to maximum benefit for everybody. So they're not allowed to dedicate all of it to wildlife. They're not allowed to dedicate all of it to ranching or energy or... Um, dirt biking or things like that. So that's multiple use. So once again, just to give you guys a little bit of context here, the Pawnee National Grasslands are in uh, northeast Colorado, uh, east of Alt, north of Greeley. <clears throat> and the Comanche National Grasslands are in southeast Colorado, um, near the towns of La Junta and uh, Kim. So wanted to talk a little bit first about some of the opportunities that exist for recreation on either of the national grasslands. The Pawnee is the one that's a lot closer to Denver, and it gets a lot more visitors. Um, the Pawnee Buttes are the most famous um, attraction that they have out there. It's a geological formation. Uh, it's very, very famous for its bird watching. It's actually listed as a heritage site for some of the best bird watching in the world. They get thousands of species that pass throughout the area. There are several areas on there called migrant traps, which are um, unique areas that are, that are more heavily forested along creeks or things like that. So when migratory birds come through, they'll actually hold over on the Pawnee for a longer period of time. So if you go in the spring or the fall at the right time, you can see tens and hundreds of different uh, bird species that you wouldn't otherwise see throughout the year. Um, as with any Forest Service uh, parcel, there's hiking and camping. There's dispersed camping available pretty much anywhere. There is a uh, designated camp spot 
Uh, one of the really neat things is that because these lands were initially homesteads that kind of went sour and were bought back, there's a lot of Eastern Colorado history out there. So I have a picture here. This is an old homestead building um, that you can see. And if you just drive around, it's really not that hard to kind of get a sense for what life in Colorado really looked like back in the, 18, um, back in the 1880s and beyond. Um, and then <clears throat> I have on there recreational target shooting. That's really kind of the, uh, the crux of Pawnee National Grassland Management right now, and we'll, we'll touch back on that later. There's a picture of the Pawnee Buttes. It's, a, a, I believe, a sand, part, some type of sandstone formation that has yet to erode away. Eventually, um, in you know, 20,000 years plus, they'll be gone. So see them while you can. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The wildlife is one of the biggest draws for me out to the Pawnee National Grassland. Here's a picture of uh, a herd of pronghorn antelope and a little burrowing owl friend who's, who's watching over them. Pronghorn antelope is a fascinating creature. A lot of people don't really give them their due respect because they're so prevalent throughout um, the Great Plains area. They're the second fastest animal, land animal on the, in the, on the planet, fastest land animal in North America. So, <clears throat> Cheetah. Um, as I said, the bird watching is superlative. There are a lot of uh, seasonal holding ponds, so you can get water birds, and there's a night hawk and a burrowing owl. Um, we have, a, we have a, a game camera out there on the Pawnee. We're doing some research, and so these are all just goofy pictures of animals that they took of themselves. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah, right. That's a good point. Uh, I should take that down. It's dangerous precedent. So the Comanche National Grassland is over 440,000 acres. It's in southeastern Colorado. It's a bit of a drive. You, it's not really on the way to anything. You have to be trying to go there. But once you do, it's a, it's a really spectacular area. It's split up into two units. The northernmost area, the northern unit is called the Tempest Unit, and that's more short grass prairie as we're familiar with it. The Carrizo unit in the south is uh, carved canyons and pinyon country, which is really quite spectacular in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> the wildlife viewing, again, on the Comanche is probably even better than the Pawnee. The Purgat Purgatory Canyon is the large uh, kind of tourist destination for life. Thank you, Kat. Tourist destination, for lack of a better word. There are a bunch of different... Um, unique features about that site that I'll, I'll hit on. And one of the coolest things is that humans have been living in and around the Comanche National Grassland for about 5,000 years. And so along with that, there's a lot of Paleolithic um, evidence of human civilization, including some rock art that you can find carved on rocks throughout the canyons. The Forest Service, to their credit, will not tell you where they are because they figure if they make that information publicly available that it'll get vandalized and it'll be gone. But it is out there. Um, I have not managed to be lucky enough to stumble across any of it yet, but if any of you are, please, uh, <clears throat> please let me know. Um, so the, the wildlife on the Comanche is um, more diverse and more prevalent than on the Pawnee because it's not as close to, to Denver and it's not as frequently visited. That was a rattlesnake that rattled at me one time while I was on a hunting trip. That was not something I'll soon forget. So one of the big uh, wildlife features of the Comanche, in fact, southeastern Colorado in general, is the tarantula migration in the fall, which is a horrifying combination of words. <laughs> but <clears throat> around, late, around late August, they'll come out of their burrows and they'll start wandering around and looking for mates. And so you'll see them by the dozens crossing the roads. They're really pretty, yeah. I, <laughs> I used to think it would be really intimidating, but they're really quite innocuous. And in fact, I had my perception of... Um, Tarantula has changed forever. When I saw, this is not my photo, but you can see these out there. And I, I came back and I, I you know, was thinking in my head, what is that? And I'm not an entomologist. It's a tarantula hawk. It's a parasitic wasp that will hunt these tarantulas and, and sting them and paralyze them and lay their eggs on them for the larvae when they hatch and everything. So if as scary as you think a tarantula is, keep in mind that there's something <laughs> so much worse. <laughs> The choyas on the Comanche National, on the Comanche will bloom usually in June, and they uh, it's just fields and fields of these brilliant purple wildflowers for miles. It's, it's really quite incredible. There's a lot of really neat history on the Comanche as well. This is the old and foundation for an old homestead, and you can see from this picture that if you really look around pretty much in 360 degrees, the only other 
indication that you're living with other humans on the planet is the dirt road that took you to this site. There's, it's just so barren. And even today, in motorized vehicles with gasoline, it's, it's intimidating to think what would happen if I'm out here and anything goes wrong. But just imagine you're back here and you have you know, a horse and buggy and something, happen, something goes wrong and you have to, it's a you know, three day trip back to town. <clears throat> this is a picture of Purgatory Canyon. This is the large, uh, the most visited destination in uh, the Comanche. And it's really spectacular because you're driving along and it's just flat as a pancake, short grass prairie, and there are cacti and there are tumbleweeds and nothing really looks that spectacular. And then half a mile later, the bottom just drops out from the earth and it's a 600 foot deep canyon that's been carved by the Purgatory River, which runs through the middle of it. And one of the really fascinating things is that it bears. Um, evidence of really pretty much every stage of inhabit, uh, inhabitation. If it's not a word, it is now. And of, of basically every stage in which humans have lived in there. The, like I mentioned, there's the native rock art. The Dolores mission is from the 1890s, and some of these headstones are still in pretty good shape, and you can see the names, and you can see the dates that they're buried out there. Um, and this is the, these are the remnants of the actual mission, uh, so that's pretty cool. One thing that I, uh, I forgot to mention, Purgatory Canyon is kind of a spooky name, right? So it got its name because this, there was a group of Spanish settlers who were actually killed by Native Americans, and they didn't have a priest with them to bless the dead bodies. And so when the French found out about that, they decided that the souls of these Spanish explorers were still trapped in the canyon in Purgatory, or um, <clears throat> Purgatoire is, I, I believe, I'm not a French speaker, but I believe the, the fr native French for it. You'll also see the, the kind of bastardized English picket wire for the people who couldn't figure out what Purgatoire was really supposed to be. They decided it just sounded like picket wire. So if you see on a map, Purgatory, picket wire, and Purgatoire are all the same, the same canyon. <clears throat> now, the coolest thing, I think, in the Comanche National Grassland is the dinosaurs track site along the, the Purgatory River. It's the, one of the largest and best preserved dinosaur track sites anywhere in the, in the world. Um, there are, these are from an Apatosaurus walking along the river, and then they also have theropod tracks from an Allosaurus. Um, the Forest Service does do a lot of preservation work on this, and they do have um, uh, motorized tours. You can have a, a Forest Service ranger drive you down there to, uh, to kind of look around. Um, there are dinosaur fossils that are constantly being unearthed and discovered throughout the Comanche, uh, throughout the, specifically the, the Purgatory Canyon, because the canyon goes down through so many, you know, millions of years of, of history. The Forest Service does have a really neat volunteer program. If you want to go help them excavate, it is preposterously oversubscribed and therefore really hard to get, it, get into. Um, but I've heard it's really neat. I haven't had a, an opportunity to do so yet. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to talk now about some of the challenges that the grasslands face, uh, specifically as national grasslands and generally as the short grass prairie. So um, for those of you in the back who might not be able to see uh, their pictures, this is a lesser earless lizard who is, I like to think, thoughtfully contemplating all of the garbage that has been left around um, his prairie home. <clears throat> So as I mentioned earlier, multiple use, this is a mandate given to both the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, and the U.S. Forest Service, and it requires them to, um, it says, manage in a combination that will best meet the needs of the American people. So that's why you end up with a shooting range half a mile away from a hiking trail, half a mile away from an oil and gas well, half a mile away from uh, an ATV trail. So multiple use is the mandate, and unlike something like a, a fish and wildlife refuge or, say, a national park, which are managed specifically for uh, very narrow purposes, usually in terms of aesthetics and ecological enjoyment, forest service land is used kind of by everybody. So along with that, the big use of the Pawnee right now in the Comanche is grazing. Um, cows are unfortunately the most common four-legged animal you're going to see out there. Um, <clears throat> Grazing on federal lands is broken down into what are called animal unit months, or AUMs. And it's the amount of forage that one cow and her calf need to survive for an entire month. It's also, I think, five sheep, or now they have different equivalencies, but the one that, that really matters in eastern Colorado is the, is the, the beef. So <clears throat> it's been in the news with varying frequency lately, but... Federal land is grazed for 
a very, very subsidized rate. Um, private land is much more expensive. In 2016, it cost $2.11 for an AUM. This year, uh, Congress, in their infinite wisdom, lowered it to $1.87. Um, a, uh, a survey by Colorado State University found that um, on private land, the equivalent cost of an AUM ranges anywhere from $12 to $18. So when these ranchers get the, uh, the permits to, to graze on public lands, they're at um, often 16% or even lower. <clears throat> so one thing that I want you guys to think about, especially as you drive around and you see animals out, cows out in the prairie, is that... The National Resource Conservation Service has figured out equivalents for a lot of these AUMs. So for the same amount of forage that you can support one cow and her calf, you can support one bison, six-tenths of an elk, which is an interesting visual, <laughs> or five antelope. <clears throat> um, so think of every time you see a cow, and in, in, uh, on the Pawnee last, in the summer of 2015, which is the most recent data I have, um, you can get sorry, 1.4, elk for every cow. Now I have to do math on the spot and I can't do it. But in 2015, there were round down to 60,000 AUMs on the Pawnee. That's equivalent to 60,000 cows throughout the course of the summer. If you converted all of those to other animals, native wildlife, like bison, elk, or antelope, you could have... Um, 100,000 elk or 300,000 antelope, the total estimate for the entire state of Colorado's antelope population in 2014 was 79,000. So if we decide, made the decision as a society not to graze just the Pawnee National Grassland and devote all that forage to antelope instead, we would almost quadruple the entire state's population of antelope just by doing that in 193,000 acres, which is not even... I don't know what proportion of the state it is, but <clears throat> the most controversial critter on the, on the prairie right now is the prairie dog, especially in urban environments. Um, up in Boulder, we always have construction projects going on that are going to displace prairie dogs or, or different circumstances in which they outgrow their, the areas where they live or things like that. And so there's this very severe divide between people who think that prairie dogs are nuisance pests who need to be gotten rid of at all costs and people who don't think that they should be bothered in any capacity. Um, <clears throat> prairie dogs are kind of given short shrift in terms of how interesting they are as wildlife. They look like, I mean, they are rodents and they, don't, they seem like pests, but they have extremely complex social structures and they actually use unique dialects between the two, between um, colonies. Scientists have taken prairie dogs from one area of a state and moved them to another area of the state and they are unable to communicate because their dialects are so different. So think someone from Canada trying to talk to someone from the Florida panhandle. And that's kind of the, you know, the difference in, in accents and dialects that you get. You get that even within prairie dogs. <clears throat> now the big problem with prairie dogs is that they obviously dig and they eat grass. And the other thing that eats grass that we want to be eating the grass are cows. So every time people see prairie dogs in eastern Colorado on the greater prairie, they think, well, those are competition for, for my cows. So landowner conflicts are a huge problem, especially on the federal lands where people expect their cows to be able to graze for the $1.87 that they're spending and not have to compete with the prairie dogs. And those are amplified by the ownership patterns of the land on the Pawnee. As we saw, a lot of those, that, what looked like a huge block of green for those prairie dogs is not. It's in fact um, many smaller, you know, often 640 acres at a time that are on federal land. And then all of a sudden, if these federally managed prairie dogs move on to the private land, well, that's not the rancher's problem. So how are we going to handle that? So there are conflicts constantly between people who want to see wildlife on the federal land and people who want to be able to raise their livestock on their private land. And so a lot of that comes down to using lethal control. The Forest Service uses... Um, oftentimes they contract with wild, uh, wildlife services, which is an organization through the Department of Agriculture that goes in and they'll poison swaths of prairie dogs to um, reduce competition in certain areas. The, the plan for the Pawnee is to have anywhere between 1,000 and 8,500 acres of prairie dog habitat of the 193,000 total. So that was part of um, a plan that they created in 2006 
that a lot of people think needs to be revised or just scrapped completely. Um, <clears throat> the state of Colorado manages them both as wildlife and as nuisance pests. And unfortunately, it's not that germane of a difference because as, as wildlife or as unregulated pests, they're pretty much allowed to be shot at will. Um, on public land, the, you're limited in the number of months, but basically you can go out and you can shoot as many prairie dogs as you want and then, that, then just go home. And so I think um, I would like to see them treated more as unique wildlife, especially given the keystone role that they play in the ecosystem, which could be an entire series of golden beer talks in and of itself. <clears throat> um, and also the interesting thing, the, uh, the, the native predator of prairie dogs is the black-footed ferret. And they, they are usually what historically have helped keep prairie dog populations suppressed and reduced um, until we had the plague. And then, so there are really neat programs with the Fish and Wildlife Service that allow you to reintroduce black-footed ferrets from conservation centers and that they'll help control the prairie dog population. Unfortunately, you need 1,500 contiguous acres of prairie dog habitat in order to reintroduce the ferrets. And so if you're working already with that fractured ownership pattern, and then on top of that, you have to find 1,500 acres that are already part of the 8,500 maximum that have been earmarked for prairie dogs, we're kind of making things worse for ourselves and, and a lot harder than they need to be. <clears throat> Energy development is the other um, big controversy on the, on the Pawnee. Right now, um, most recent count, there were 63 active oil and gas wells, fracking wells. Um, the problem, there was just a big study out of Wyoming that found that, in fact, heavy oil and gas development did impact mule deer populations in a negative way because it, not only would they try to avoid the oil and gas pads, but it impacted their migration routes, which then translated to an impact on the overall population. And so we have the same thing in eastern Colorado. Um, <clears throat> This is part of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission GIS map. This is US, uh, State Highway 14 running through the Pawnee National Grasslands. This is um, one section. Each one of these little red dots is an oil and gas well. Some of them have been capped. Some of them are active. Some of them never even turned into developed wells. But these are every single one of these spots, and this is just a few acres of the area, are areas where oil and gas development have taken place. Uh, part of the Obama administration's mission on the on Forest Service lands and on the Pawnee specifically was that they would add what are called no surface occupancy stipulations to all federal oil and gas leases. So if you got the rights to mine some of the gas that was underlying these federal lands, you would have to do it from private property. And so a lot of the times that made things much more efficient because there were already gas pads on these, these um, private lands. And so you could just um, drill new holes in, in, in new directions. So um, the last decade or so, we have not seen an increase, much of an increase in surface occupancy on uh, specifically the Pawnee National Grassland. Time has, will tell whether that holds true um, for the current administration. Um, but there is big, big money in this. Um, in 2015, they leased 33,000 acres worth of oil and gas rights under the Pawnee, and it brought in $32 million. So this is not going anywhere, especially now that, that things are starting to improve a little bit for the industry. Last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the recreational target shooting. Um, it's the most popular pastime out there on the Pawnee, which is why another reason why I'm really excited to be able to talk to you guys about it, and hopefully it'll start getting traction as a place that's better for more than just shooting stuff. Um, the problem out there is that the land is so disparate, and the Forest Service's resources are, in, in fairness, extremely limited in terms of enforcement and, um, and oversight, that it's really hard for them to catch people when they do stuff like... Um, this looks like gravel, but these are all broken pieces of clay target. I mean, you see the shotgun shells. These are pieces of plastic wadding. I don't know if any of you are shotgun hunters, but there are many pieces of plastic that come inside of a shotgun shell that just get flung out onto the prairie, and then they're left there. Um, not to mention the lead ammunition. So really, whether it takes 10 years or 100 years, it's only a matter of time before the shooting range at the Pawnee is a super fun site because we're just pumping it full of lead, and there's no way to get all that stuff back out of the soil. The serious problems are when people take, for whatever reason, furniture or old electronics or consumer appliances out there and use them as target practice. So these are, uh, there's a television, I guess a fax machine, um, there's a printer. And the real problem are these things. If you're ever out there and you see one of these that's intact, let the Forest Service know. 
these are exploding targets. They come in a, they're about $5 from Cabela's. They come in this little plastic jar and they have two bags of chemicals in them. You combine the chemicals, you mix it up, and you shoot it and it explodes into a fireball. And some people need to be told not to do that on a dry prairie at the end of July where it takes the fire, the fire department 45 minutes to get to you. And so you end up with things like this. You can see the outline of this burn scar. This was several hundred acres, and these happen routinely every year, and they're getting more and more common. They had five in 2016. I think they're up to three this year, and there's no real end in sight. Um, so <clears throat> keep, pushing, keep helping us push for better shooting management. But it's not all you know, bad news, especially CPI, if you'll allow me to... Uh, a few moments to kind of talk about some of our work. We do have a lot of opportunities to allow people like you guys to get involved to help improve the situation on the prairie and help protect it so that for future generations can see it the way you know we've always wanted to be able to see it. Um, this is from a trip we took out there to the grasslands to pick up trash that people left behind from recreational shooting. You can see this is a full-size pickup, the Forest Service. They let us use it, and we filled it up. Um, We've got a couple projects um, along the foothills in, in Boulder and in Fort Collins where we're going to replace uh, invasive Russian olive trees with Native American plums to help improve uh, wildlife habitat and hopefully try to get a control on some of the noxious weeds in, in small areas of the prairie and do what we can, especially um, the way things have been going right now. We like to say there's no such thing as a difference that's not worth making. So no matter how small of a, of a piece of property it really is, um, there's always stuff we can do to help improve it and, uh, and make life better for the wildlife that live there. So I know I went over my time a little bit. I apologize, everybody, but if, if I understand the questions come later. Yeah. Okay. Questions come later. And then thank you guys so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Okay, yeah. That. How, about, how about talking about controlled burns out there? Are there controlled burns on the, the National Prairie Lands in Colorado like there are on the Flint Hills in Canada? Yes. The, answer, the, the question was, are there controlled burns on the prairie the way there are controlled burns um, in Kansas or on some of the forest properties? The answer is yes. Uh, there are a lot of... Uh, fire, as with, the, as with the forest on the prairie, is a part of the natural cycle. You need fire to keep a lot of the woody vegetation down, keep things from turning into trees. Um, and it also burns down a lot of the grass and, and will loosen up some of the seeds for them to regrow and things like that. But one of the big things that the Forest Service does, uh, the controlled burns for, is that it improves mountain plover habitat. Mountain plovers are not endangered quite yet, but they are a, a species of bird that nest on the grasslands, and they're not doing terribly well right now. And so they prefer to nest in areas that have been burned recently or within the last few years. So yes, they do some controlled burns. Um, and so that's one of the, I don't want to say hidden benefits of those wildfires started by recreational shooters is that sometimes they happen to be in the right place, but they're completely unregulated, they're completely uncontrolled, and they're, they're guided by, by bullets and not ecology. So, um, and that is usually the official stance of the Forest Service is that, well, fire is good for the prairie, but that's not really the entire story. So, yes, the, thank you for your question. The answer is yes, there are controlled burns on the, on the prairies. Yes. Given the checkerboard nature of the, the actual public land versus private land, are there opportunities for organizations like the Nature Conservancy or other organizations to purchase land and then donate it to the Park Service? The question was whether, given the checkerboard nature of land ownership in the area, there are opportunities for nonprofit groups like the Nature Conservancy to purchase in holdings and um, provide management opportunities to, in this case, the Forest Service? And the answer is, in theory, yes. In reality, no. Because a lot of the private inholdings are so small that groups like the Nature Conservancy don't want to... They're not a management priority for them. They would prefer to have uh, much larger areas, whereas groups like us... Uh, they're, so they're too small for the Nature Conservancy, and they're too big for groups like us. Because even if you have... 1,300 acres, that's a big enough area that you could do some serious management with it. Nature Conservancy isn't that interested, and it's still over a million dollars, so groups like us are unable to, to come in and, and purchase it. Uh, one of the things that um, would really benefit, uh, in this case, the Pawnee, is if the Forest Service would kind of reprioritize 
consolidating their land. One thing they can do is trade in holding landowners land on the outskirts of the Pawnee for land that's inside. Um, they haven't made that a priority, uh, again, because they, they're extremely cash-strapped and their resources are limited, but that legislatively they are allowed to make those offers to landowners, and that would be one way to turn a large block of, of checkerboard land into a smaller block of consolidated federal holdings that would allow something like a black-footed ferret reintroduction or if, you know, who knows, bison. Um, we can think big when we can talk, talk about large pieces of, of federally, owned private, uh, federally owned prairie land. So um, in theory, yes, the, those opportunities are there. In reality, it's, it's considerably more complicated than that, unfortunately. Any other questions? Yes. Um, are there any other species that require contiguous habitat more than available Wolves. What? Wolves, elk, pronghorn, bison, um, Coyotes are good at, at, sorry, the question was, I just launched right into it. The question was whether there are other species that would require larger contiguous areas of, of prairie than we're allowing them to have in eastern Colorado right now, and the answer is yes. Um, elk historically were flatland creatures. They were pushed into the mountains by the European settlers. Um, wolves have not lived in eastern Colorado in a century. They would require a huge uh, area of, of um, <clears throat> contiguous land. Grizzly bears were formerly um, grassland habitats. Lewis and Clark wrote extensively about grizzly bear encounters when they came across. They don't live in eastern Colorado anymore. Um, so yes, there are a lot of things that we could do with, with a, a lot of prairie if we had it. Yes. What are people doing out there in the private land holdings? The question is what people do in the private land holdings. The, predominantly, uh, they're, they're privately held ranches. And that's also, um, as I touched on a little bit, where the, uh, where the, um, a lot of the surface uh, development for oil and gas goes. So um, they are industrialized might not be the right word for it, but um, they're pr primarily used for economic purposes. Not to say that there are not, there are ranchers out there who are extremely conscientious of conservation and the ecological value of the land they've been put in charge of, and the Forest Service does good work with, with a lot of the ranchers who hold Pawnee leases to make sure that they manage them in areas that are beneficial for the short grass and, and bring more of a long view to, to ranching out there. Um, but ranching is definitely, ranching followed by oil and gas are the, the big uses out there, especially for the private land. There's not a lot of um, hard rock mineral mining or coal anywhere really in eastern Colorado right now. So, yeah. The question was whether there are still visual reminders of the Dust Bowl when you go out there today and um, indications that that took place. Um, the best thing that I can think of is, are the houses that people left behind. There are a lot of houses that you can find toys, you can find remnants of, of household items that people, they just left their lives because things went so badly. Um, so that's the big thing. Ecologically, I'm a lawyer by training. I'm not a botanist. I wish I was. Um, there, there, I'm sure there are ecological indicators that the bus, Dust Bowl took place. Um, the Pawnee is, is a little bit more intact in terms of the plants and the grasses that are out there than the Comanche is because the Comanche got hit so much harder by the Dust Bowl. There are huge areas that are acres and acres of Russian, thist of, uh, Russian thistles out there. Um, you might know them as tumbleweeds. Um, and so those are much more much heavier in the, in the southeast part of the state that was hit harder by the Dust Bowl than they are in the northeast part that did not get hit as badly. Yes. How often do you do events? The question was how often we do volunteer events. Not nearly as often as I would like, um, but we try to do at least two a year. We have two, potentially three, coming up in October. If anybody's interested, I, I did bring business cards, um, which I never do. So you guys should feel <laughs> feel fortunate that I remembered for you. Um, we have a one project where, we're, like I mentioned, we're going to be planting the trees in Boulder and then in Fort Collins. We are given an opportunity to do a swift fox survey with the Forest Service where we'll drive around with their biologist at night and shine flashlights into fields and try and survey the population of swift foxes out there, and they're looking for volunteers for that. And then we are also doing a... Um, there was a, the Pawnee flooded in, in 
one area last summer, and it blew out a fence that was protecting some historic trees where, that provide uh, nesting habitat for raptors. And so we went in early spring this year and tore out the fence that was um, broken and along the ground because wildlife were getting tangled up in it. And then in October, we're going to go back with the Forest Service and we're going to replace the fence. So we'll need a couple of people for that too. So we have what is that four we have four things coming up this year i'm hoping we'll have at least as many next year and on into the future because there's a lot of work that needs to be done so thank you for that question anybody else cool thank you guys so much again this is a blast